The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerreview.com forward slash TPR860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, and welcome to Innovative Immunotherapy and Advanced Basal Cell Carcinoma, Evolving Science, Key Clinical Evidence, and Implications for Multidisciplinary Management. Uh, my name is Dr. Carl Lewis. I'm a medical oncologist at the University of Colorado, specializing in the treatment of cutaneous malignancies. And my esteemed colleagues uh, joining me today include Dr. Raghi Kuchikar, uh, who is Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of the Skin Cancer and Melanoma Research uh, Program at Emory University, and Dr. Michael Migdon, who's Professor of Dermatology and Head and Neck Surgery at MD Anderson. Today's agenda We'll first go over and characterize basal cell carcinoma and the current therapeutic landscape. And then we'll focus on the role of immunotherapy and locally advanced and metastatic basal cell carcinoma. And then we'll have a tumor board session where challenging cases in basal cell carcinoma and the role of immune options uh, will be presented. And so with that, Dr. Migdon. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Um, I'll discuss the oncology team approach to diagnosing and classifying basal cell carcinoma. BCC is the most common form of skin cancer. You see an example here on the right. Incidence is increasing worldwide. There are roughly 3 million cases diagnosed in the United States each year. The incident uh, rate is uh, doubles from age 40 to 70 years. Uh, currently, the incident in those younger than 40 years old is also increasing. So three key points on BCC pathogenesis. Ultraviolet B light is a driver, the predominant driver of keratinocyte progenitor cell mutagenesis towards BCC. Constitutive activation of the hedgehog signaling pathway is responsible and sufficient for BCC carcinogenesis. Uh, BCC has the greatest tumor mutational burden of any human cancer, but it's not included in the cancer genome atlas. On the right, we see the hedgehog pathway and the environmental risk factors for BCC include male uh, and uh, extended age, UV radiation uh, exposure, particularly intermittent acute exposure during childhood. So that would be in the form of possibly multiple blistering sunburns, indoor tanning and medical light treatments such as UVA and UVB, ionizing radiation, repeat microinjury scars, chronic ulcers of the lower limbs and prolonged exposure to chemical agents. Also exposure to photosensitizing drugs can be a potential risk factor. And looking at uh, the characterization of BCC at presentation, they can resemble non-cancerous uh, skin conditions such as focal psoriasis or eczema. Uh, patients often will report enlarging non-healing lesions and sometimes bleeding, also sometimes pruritus, but typically they deny other symptoms. But once you have the history and physical and suspicious uh, lesion on exam, we need to do biopsy for confirmation. And visualizing the five warning signs for BCC would include an open sore or any type of sore that does not heal, a shiny bump or nodule, a small pink growth with a slightly raised rolled edge and crusted indentation in the center, although sometimes it's not crusted a reddish patch or irritated area, or a scar. And the scar can be very subtle. It can be flat, white, yellow, or waxy in color. So the NCCN uh, principles of pathology reporting, um, pathologic evaluation of skin biopsies is ideally performed by dermatologists, pathologists, or dermatopathologists experienced in interpreting cutaneous neoplasms. The clinical information that should be submitted on a biopsy requisition include patient demographics, anatomic location, prior treatment of the lesion, clinical diameter of the lesion, and risk factors such as immunosuppression, uh, prior radi radiotherapy, or others. And then included on the report should be the histologic, 
uh, subtype because some subtypes are higher risk uh, features that include risks for, excuse me, that increased risk for local recurrence, such as invasion of tumor beyond uh, the reticular dermis and perineural invasion, as particularly if the nerve uh, is uh, below the dermis or greater than 0.1 millimeter in caliber. Nodular basal carcinoma is the most common subtype. It accounts for 50 to 80 percent of lesions commonly found in sun-exposed areas of head and neck. Lesions typically present as this shiny, pearly papular nodule with a smooth surface and rolled borders, and arborizing telangiectasias can be a hallmark. Uh, typically, uh, slow-growing, advanced tumors that can become large and ulcerate, and sometimes known as rodent ulcers. The BCC subtypes are shown here. On the top, you see the lower risk, which would include nodular and superficial, uh, less commonly infundibular cystic and fibroepithelial. On the bottom row, uh, the higher risk, which would include infiltrative or morpheiform, also micronodular and basal squamous. Factors for high risk of recurrence in basal carcinoma include uh, lesions forming in the mask area of the face, including central face, eyelids, eyebrows, preorbital nose, lips, both the cutaneous and vermilion lip, chin, mandible, preauricular, postauricular, uh, temple, and ear, uh, as well as others, and then the cheek, uh, forehead, scalp, neck, and uh, pretivia and then lesions greater than or equal to two centimeters on the trunk and extremities. Also, another feature would be uh, poorly defined borders, uh, recurrent lesion, immunosuppression or prior radiotherapy in the area, and then the pathology would be one of the higher risks with a more aggressive growth pattern, and then also perineural would be a high risk feature. And the principles of therapy for basal carcinoma is that surgery is the treatment of choice in most cases. So this for the highest cure rate would be most surgery followed by complete margin control, the gold standard for facial higher risk or recurrent BCCs, especially in critical anatomic areas. These are associated with uh, the higher cure rates and those is the highest. Electrodesiccation and curatage and standard excision are also recommend, uh, re recommended options for low-risk BCC. Of course, standard excision at least provides some margin control in terms of a survey says less than 1% of the actual contact margin is examined, but at least there's a margin examined, whereas electrodesiccation and curatage has no margin examination. And then for selected cases, radiotherapy can be considered. These would include frail patients or possibly those with low, with, with a poor uh, performance status. Now the pros and cons of treatment options for basal cell carcinoma. Surgical excision, as I previously alluded to, has some margin control, so that's an advantage compared to a, a, a destructive method with no margin control. But a disadvantage compared to Mohs is that it's checking less than 1% of the actual contact margin. Uh, it is somewhat cheaper than Mohs, so that's another advantage. Uh, it's faster in that you can perform the excision and let the patient be dismissed. You don't have to wait for the immediate pathologic reading of the margins. So Mohs surgery, the number one advantage, uh, number one and two would be the uh, 100% margin control, which results in the highest cure rate, so that would be number one. And uh, number two would be the tissue preservation, so it preserves the most amount of normal tissue. And then a disadvantage of Mohs, it is more costly, but not dramatically more uh, expensive than a standard excision. Uh, definitely takes longer. Patients can have uh, multiple stages taken, it, depending if there's still roots present of the tumor after the first stage, and this can take some time. Certainly requires special training, so not just anyone can do it. Um, and then on to cryosurgery. Uh, the advantage is that it's very fast, inexpensive, 
the disadvantage would be there's really no margin control, so you don't know if it's gone, and you should have to take a look. And pretty much cryosur cryosurgery is reserved for lesions that are very small, very low risk. Now on to curtage and electro desiccation, uh, similar to, to cryotherapy, it's uh, quick and inexpensive, but again, no margin control. It can be uh, more destructive um, than uh, the standard freezing. Uh, it shouldn't be done in certain areas that are hard to uh, curatage. And uh, radiation therapy, uh, this practice of primary radiation therapy treatment varies from uh, institution to institution in terms of whether they treat it treat patients as a primary treatment or whether they use it uh, more as a palliative treatment for larger lesions. I would say that most people prefer some other method for smaller lesions because they can be uh, curated and electrodesiccated or removed with excision. The uh, disadvantages include that there's no margin control, uh, that there is some tissue damage in the local radiation field. Also, uh, it's more expensive than simple excision, multiple visits, uh, on to topical 5-FU, so non-invasive, avoids operative risk. Disadvantages include that it is irritating for quite some time and there's no margin control. So let's look at recommendations for low risk basal cell carcinoma. So on the left side, we have primary treatment and on the right uh, column, we have additional treatment. So if you start with uh, standard excision or curatage and electro desiccation, uh, if you end up uh, with positive margins, you can go on to most surgery, uh, and then radiation therapy could be considered. And then, as mentioned previously, curtage and electric desiccation should be not used in terminal uh, hair-bearing areas, such as scalp, pubic, axillary regions, and beard. And if adipose is reached, then it's difficult because adipose is quite soft and not really amenable to good curatage. It uh, becomes uh, more uh, difficult to feel the edge of where tumor may be. So recommendations for high risk uh, basal carcinoma, again, primary treatment on the left and additional treatment on the right. So the gold standard would be Mohs micrographic surgery and close to that would be this complete frozen section margin control, uh, intraoperative uh, frozen section margin control. And then starting with that, if you get a positive margin, we have the additional treatment on the right, could be multidisciplinary consultation, could be um, systemic therapy. If it's a negative margin, you're pretty much done unless there was a note, there was a larger uh, perineural invasion and they might want to consider radiation therapy. And it's similar for standard excision, except that we can go for positive margins to Mohs or this intraoperative frozen section complete margin control excision and then uh, for primary treatment for high risk for non-surgical candidates, we can consider radiotherapy, uh, again, no margin control, and then systemic therapy if curative RT is not feasible. Principles of systemic therapy for locally advanced or metastatic BCC, we should consider treatment, uh, systemic uh, treatment in locally advanced or metastatic basal carcinoma, but not where other types of treatments will work. So they should not be uh, a good surgical candidate and not a great candidate for primary single modality radiation. And also, uh, you know, this is used for patients with metastatic disease. So there should be multidisciplinary uh, discussion to determine the best treatment approach and rule out surgery radiation, just to go through that uh, discussion of whether it's really appropriate or inappropriate. And then it's a decision uh, for uh, going to a hedgehog inhibitor, or if it's deemed inappropriate, you can go directly to semiplomab. So if you go to hedgehog inhibitor and the patient is not tolerating, you can consider drug holidays to address toxicity and improve adherence and improve quality of life, but if they still can't tolerate it, you can also consider going over to semiplomab. 
So we should use a, a team-based approach to BCC care because multidisciplinary care is the best care. And we have to remember that we're dealing with a primary cancer of the skin uh, and two main players of within the multidisciplinary team that you can see uh, in this slide would be medical oncology and uh, dermatologic oncology. So that would be a dermatologist who is specializing in skin cancer, could be a Mohs surgeon, could be a medical dermatologist who specializes in skin cancer. So certainly um, those two. And then you can add head and neck surgery for larger on block resection consideration, whether there's still surgery uh, possible, but beyond perhaps uh, what would be performed under local anesthesia by a Mohs surgeon, and then add radiation oncology, radiology, genetics, nursing, plastic and reconstructive surgery. So my take home on modern multidisciplinary BCC management is it's very important to consider patient-specific factors case by case when determining whether a patient is a good candidate for surgery. And we have to recognize that surgical fatigue is actually quite a valid concern. There are some patients who get to the point where they have stated, I'd rather die than have another large surgery, or where there's significant morbidity or disfigurement that can result. Number two is the tolerability of hedgehog inhibitors vary substantially from patient to patient. And the treatments can be tolerated more easily for shorter durations, harder to tolerate for longer durations. And then you have to ask, will a hedgehog inhibitor alone, uh, would, given the need for drug holidays and perhaps the lack of tolerability long term, will, will that be enough to take care of this tumor uh, in terms of a complete uh, treatment, one that won't recur? Lastly, immune checkpoint blockade is typically well tolerated and has a very high quality of life. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Mignon, for that uh, wonderful introductory talk in terms of managing uh, basal cell carcinomas. <clears throat> we'll move on now to the evidence for immunotherapy in the treatment of basal cell carcinomas. And uh, currently the use of targeted agents um, is, is the preferred uh, frontline uh, treatment. And there's two uh, hedgehog inhibitors approved as Modegib, Sonidegib, uh, both proof for the use of metastatic locally advanced basal cell carcinoma. The hedgehog pathway, as um, a lot of you know, is a series of proteins, um, and often in basal cell carcinomas, there's a mutation in the so-called patch protein, and that leads uh, to constitutive activation of smoothen. And the hedgehog inhibitors are actually smoothened inhibitors, and you can see very uh, robust activity uh, with these agents. And that's shown on the right-hand side of this slide with the upper panel, the patient with a very large basal cell carcinoma around the ear, uh, treated with hedgehog uh, inhibitor, and you can see uh, a great response uh, to treatment. But there is tolerability issues as it relates uh, to these agents. Fortunately, most of the toxicity in my experience, tends to be low-grade toxicity, grade one, two toxicity. It's very predictable. Uh, patients have muscle spasms, they have hair loss, and they have taste alterations, often uh, completely losing their taste. And when I start patients on these agents, you tell them you can expect these toxicities. But these can lead to significant quality of life issues. Obviously, having a severe muscle cramping is not conducive to a good quality of life. If you can't taste food, you end up having uh, weight loss. And there is a discontinuation rate uh, due to these adverse events. There was a publication a couple of years ago that was the final update of the so-called Aravance study, which was uh, the initial study of Bismodegib. Uh, in locally advanced and metastatic basal cell carcinoma. Uh, this final update was somewhere around 40 months after the last patient was accrued. And you can see when you combine um, all the patients, a total of 104 in the locally advanced and metastatic cohorts, only 8% of the patients remained on treatment. 92% of the patients discontinued. Looking down at the bottom of the slide, 28% uh, of the patients discontinued to disease progression. 
and 21% discontinued due to an adverse event. But I do think that that 21% is, is likely an underestimation of stopping for adverse events. Because if you look at, at this table, 26% of the patients who discontinued it was patient decision. About 10% it was physician decision. And probably, at least in, in, in terms of patient decisions, it was due to an adverse event. These drugs become difficult to tolerate long term. And so what should be used to treat patients who are post hedgehog inhibitor therapy, namely resistant to or intolerable of the hedgehog treatment? And the question is, should that be immune therapy? Or the question was, should that be immune therapy? And there was rationale for this. And the immune system plays a critical role in surveillance and eradication of non-melanoma skin cancers. And this is exemplified if you look at solid organ transplant patients, there's a 65-fold increase in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma in this patient population, and a tenfold increase in basal cell carcinomas in this patient population. The tumor microenvironment of UV-induced tumors is immunosuppressive, and the innate immune system can eradicate UV-associated tumors, and this is exemplified by amiquimod, which is a TLR agonist, and it can be used to treat basal cell carcinomas. And immunotherapy clearly has activities in other cutaneous malignancies. These are other cancers with high mutation burdens, UV-induced mutations, uh, signatures, uh, melanoma, which was the uh, first agent to have these modern checkpoint inhibitors, uh, or, excuse me, the first disease to have these modern checkpoint inhibitors approved. It's subsequently been approved to treat Merkel cell carcinoma uh, recently, uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, and there's several PD-1 uh, and pd 1 inhibitors available. And then finally, why not? These agents seem to work in, in many other types of cancer. So there has been some correlation, as been mentioned before, with tumor mutation burden and response to immunotherapy. And basal cell carcinomas derive from epidermal keratinocytes that are chronically exposed to ultraviolet light, which is a well-known mutagen. And this contributes to one of the highest mutational uh, burdens in cancer. And this is a study that looked at basal cell carcinoma mutation burden compared to non-BCC uh, tumors. And the average uh, mutation burden in basal cell carcinoma was around 90 mutations per megabase compared to non-BCCs where it was around four. Here's another study that looked at uh, different tumor types, and this is a graphic representation of tumors with greater than 10 mutations per uh, megabase. And you can see on the right-hand side, uh, cutaneous basal cell carcinoma sort of leads the pack in this area. And in fact, the first three, basal cell carcinoma, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, all are tumors with high tumor mutation burdens. And so in inducing an anti-tumor response through uh, blockade of immune checkpoints is well established now. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, representations like this. There are, are two uh, checkpoint inhibitors widely in use. If you look at the left-hand side of this slide, looking at the lymphoid tissue, an antigen presenting cell, such as a dendritic cell, will present antigen in the context of MHC uh, to the T cell but you need co-stimulation in order for that T cell to be activated. And that co-stimulation is CD28 binding to B7. And then CTLA4 starts to get upregulated on these T cells and CTLA4 binds B7 with much greater affinity than CD28. And you lack that co-stimulatory uh, signal that's needed for T cell stimulation. So anti-CTLA4 antibodies like ipil ipilimumab bind to CTLA4 and allow that co-stimulation to stay engaged. Those T cells go into uh, the peripheral tissue, into the tumor microenvironment, and then you have the T cell recognizing that tumor antigen uh, on the cancer cell, and T cells will then express PD-1, and cancer cells can upregulate PD-L1, and when you have PD-1, PD-L1 interaction, that T cell is essentially turned off. So you have PD-1 antibodies, like pembrolizumab, nivolumab, semiplumab, um, and then you have anti pdl one antibodies in use, such as atezolizumab. And there started to become sort of these hints that basal cell carcinoma could be 
um, uh, responsive to immunotherapy. And there were some case reports that were published. And this is one of those case reports that looked at uh, a basal cell carcinoma patient that had metastatic disease that was resistant to a hedgehog inhibitor. And he was treated with a PD-1 antibody nivolumab. And you can see the metastatic disease there um, uh, at baseline in the liver and four months into therapy with uh, near complete resolution of those liver lesions. In the phase one study of simiplumab, there was a couple of patients who had non-melanoma skin cancers that were enrolled, including a patient with metastatic basal cell carcinoma. And after a planned 48 weeks of treatment, the patient with metastatic basal cell carcinoma maintained a partial response 12 plus months post-treatment. These sort of data that led to the prospective phase two study of simiplumab and locally advanced basal cell carcinoma. And really a phase two study in this situation was enough to potentially gain approval of this agent because there really is no standard of care for this patient population. And there were two groups of patients in this trial. Group one was patients with metastatic basal cell carcinoma, and this was either distant metastasis or nodal metastasis. And then group two was patients with locally advanced basal cell carcinoma. They received simiplumab 350 milligrams every three weeks, and then tumor assessments were done. And uh, it was by independent review. And the primary endpoint of the trial was overall response rate by independent review and key secondary endpoints such as duration of response, progression-free survival, overall survival, complete response and safety. In terms of Inclusion criteria, they had to have a confirmation of basal cell carcinoma, they had to have prior progression, or be intolerant to hedgehog inhibitor therapy, or no better than stable disease after nine months of hedgehog inhibitor therapy. They had to have measurable disease and a good performance status. Some key exclusion criteria is they could not have had active autoimmune disease requiring immunosuppression, they could not be uh, previously treated with either a PD-1 or anti pdl one therapy or have concurrent malignancy. And here's the cohort of patients the, the, in, in the locally advanced uh, group. There were 84 patients and this was presented at the uh, European Society of Medical Oncology meeting um, in 2020 and was recently uh, published in Lancet Oncology. Um, the median age was uh, 70, <clears throat> uh, predominant men 56%, and good fit, over half the patients had an ECOG performance status is zero. The primary site of the tumor was 75% in the head and neck. Uh, only 7% of the lesions were on the trunk. So primarily head and neck basal cell carcinomas. And in terms of reasons for discontinuation of the prior uh, hedgehog, 60% uh, had progressive disease on the uh, prior hedgehog treatment. Um, 32 percent were deemed to be intolerant to the hedgehog um, and 7% no better than stable disease after nine months of therapy. And here's the response and duration of response in the locally advanced cohort. So in the 84 patients, there was an overall response rate of 26%, or excuse me, of 31%, 26 patients had a response. So 31% overall response rate. 6% of patients had a complete response, 25% a partial response, and 49% stable disease for a disease control rate of 80%. Only nine patients had progressive disease as the best response. Uh, and the median estimation of duration of response by independent review was not reached. One thing that is interesting, if you look at the swimmer's plot there on the right-hand side of this slide, so the purple circles are stable disease and the green triangles are, are patients who have obtained a partial response. And, and this is the swimmer's plot of patients with a response. And what, what stands out uh, to me is that most of the patients who respond were not responding at the time of first assessment. And you can see at that uh, point there that most of those patients have stable disease. There are a couple of early uh, responders, but most of the patients were stable diseases. It isn't until later into the treatment that you start seeing responses in these patients. And so I think looking at, at a, a graph like this, it really 
brings home the message that you can't give up on these patients too early who you're starting on immunotherapy with advanced basal cell carcinoma. If they're not progressing, they're tolerating the therapy, I do think you need to stick with it a little while because you do see late responses in this disease. And here's a couple of examples uh, in reductions of visible lesions in the locally advanced cohort. Uh, on the left-hand side, there's the patient's baseline tumor, uh, quite an erosive tumor, uh, treated with semiplomab, and that photo is day uh, 726, so a, a very good response. Uh, to the PD-1 therapy. Similar uh, result in the, in the second panel there, uh, locally advanced basal cell carcinoma on the forehead, and then the post-treatment follow-up uh, photo at day uh, 708. So looking at response to semiplomab by pd one status, it doesn't seem that this is a good biomarker of predicting response. So 50 patients were included in this analysis, 35 patients had pd one expression less than 1%, um, 15 patients had pd one expression greater than 1%, and the overall response rate was uh, 26 and 27, respectively. Disease control rate, 77% and 87%, respectively. And so there really doesn't seem to be a, um, a much of you being able to use pd one as a marker of predicting response in this disease. Here's the progression-free survival and overall survival curves for the locally advanced cohort. Median progression-free survival, just over 19 months, and median overall survival not reached. Also, what's been presented is the interim analysis of the results for the metastatic cohort. This was a pre-planned interim analysis of this cohort, and it included 28 patients who had sufficient follow-up uh, to, to get a, a sense of response. Um, the median age of this cohort was 65 years, 82% um, were male, more than half of the patients' ECOG performance status is zero, and half of the patients, the primary tumor site was on the trunk. This is in contrast to the locally advanced cohort, where most of the primary tumors were head and neck. 40% in this cohort were head and neck primary. 32% of the patients had distant disease only. 54% distant nodal disease, and 14% nodal disease only. Uh, the median duration of exposure was uh, approaching 40 weeks, and the median number of doses was 13. And the overall response rate in the metastatic cohort was 21% in this preplanned interim analysis. There were no complete responders. All of the responses were partial response. 36% of the patients had stable disease, uh, about 11% had non-complete response slash non-progressive disease. These are patients who were by independent review deemed not to actually have measurable disease um, at study entry and therefore could only be assessed if, if they had a complete response or if they progressed. And 25% had pro progressive disease as the best response. 68% disease control rate and 46% durable disease control rate. So metastatic cohort, 21% uh, overall response rate. And here's a swimmer's plot for, for these six patients who responded. And again, the, the purple circles are stable disease. The green triangles are partial response. Um, three of the six responders responded at initial assessment, but the other three, there was that delayed response that we talked about previously, including that bottom patient there that didn't get a response till uh, almost a year into therapy. Here's the progression-free survival and overall survival curves for this cohort of patients. Again, this is an interim analysis uh, of this um, cohort in the estimated median progression-free survival is eight months and the estimated median overall survival about 26 months. So in terms of safety, there did not appear to be any new safety signals as it related to semiplomab uh, in this study uh, compared to prior semiplomab trials as well as prior PD-1 uh, trials. The most common treatment-related adverse events uh, reported are uh, fatigue and asthenia as well as pruritus. What was listed as grade three or greater treatment-related adverse events included four cases of colitis and a case of two cases of fatigue and adrenal insufficiency.
uh, listed as immune-related adverse events of any grade, uh, hypothyroidism and colitis, in grade three immune-related adverse events in more than one patient, there are three cases of colitis and adrenal insufficiency. Importantly, there were no grade four or five immune-related adverse events reported. At ASCO 2021, uh, there's a report of a uh, quality of life in this patient population, and it does appear there's a clinically meaningful improvement or stability in the global health score, quality of life, and functional status of patients treated with semiplumab um, uh, with uh, locally advanced basal cell carcinoma. So the take homes as it relates to semiplumab and basal cell carcinoma, uh, semiplumab is the first systemic therapy to show clinical benefit in patients with locally advanced basal cell carcinoma after hedgehog inhibitor therapy. There was a 31% overall response rate in the locally advanced cohort. The 12 month duration of response, um, 85%. Uh, baseline PDL1 expression is not, does not appear to be associated with efficacy. There is an acceptable safety profile consistent with other PD1 antibodies and with previous reports of semiplumab and other tumors. And these results led to the FDA approval of semiplumab in patients with locally advanced basal cell carcinoma previously treated with hedgehog inhibitor or for whom hedgehog inhibitor therapy is not appropriate. In addition, it was also approved uh, for metastatic BCC patients previously treated with a hedgehog inhibitor. There are ongoing clinical studies with immune therapy. Here's, here's a couple of examples. There is a neoadjuvant slash adjuvant trial of pembrolizumab in resectable BCC of the head and neck. Patients will receive four doses of pembrolizumab up front, followed by resection and then adjuvant treatment. Primary endpoint is pathologic response in that. There is a multi-arm trial as well, looking at nivolumab, as well as uh, other checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so arm A is nivolumab alone. You have arm B, which is nivolumab and ipilimumab. And then there's also an arm with nivolumab and a LAG3 antibody. Primary endpoint overall response rate in that study. So just some concluding thoughts in terms of uh, basal cell carcinoma, the discontinuation rate for hedgehog inhibitor therapy is quite high due to progressive disease as well as tolerability issue with these agents. Um, and semiplumab has now demonstrated meaningful and durable responses in patients with locally advanced and in terms of the interim analysis, metastatic uh, BCC patients in a prospective clinical trial. I think importantly, uh, responses can take time to develop in this population, so you do need uh, to try to maintain these patients on therapy if at all possible. The toxicity profile is similar uh, to PD-1 antibodies and other tumor types, and semiplomab is now approved for locally advanced and metastatic uh, BCC uh, after hedgehog therapy or patients intolerable to that. So before we move on to the next section, I, I, we do have time for some questions and answers. Um, and some questions came in. Uh, the first is, is there a role for neoadjuvant vismodegiv, and do you foresee any potentially uh, for neoadjuvant immunotherapy? Uh, Dr. Kuchikar, do you have thoughts on this? I think, uh... If we can reduce the morbidity of surgery, um, neoadjuvant therapy, vismodegib has a very high response rate. If we can reduce morbidity, um, there's a few case series publications showing maybe less plastic surgery, less morbidity to the patient. But I would keep in mind that if it's easily resectable and you can be curative with resection, I would still think that's our upfront therapy, but if there is a need to reduce morbidity of surgery, especially around the orbit and other places, um, I think there is a role for neoadjuvant therapy. Dr. McGinn, are you using neoadjuvant approach in your practice at all? No, the studies are somewhat limited in this right. um, well, setting. Just so, sorry, it just so happens that I have a case that I'm dealing with right now and uh, the way I look at it is the patients can be locally advanced at the time you initiate the neoadjuvant vismodigib with the thought that perhaps after treatment uh, proceeds, uh, 
they can fall out of that category of locally advanced to where surgery is more amenable. In this case, the patient has already had a nearby large uh, basal cell removed, had a large flap, all the reservoir for reconstruction has already been used in the area. And then there's this other locally advanced tumor right there that, you know, even if I could clear it all would be extremely hard without disfigurement to, to uh, repair. So that's the scenario that I'm using it in. But uh, so uh, to stay true to the label, I still think they should be locally at the advanced at the time that you initiate it, not just a convenience neoadjuvant use. Yeah, and then in terms of neoadjuvant immunotherapy, you know, obviously that's <clears throat> going to need much, uh, much more investigation before that would be, you know, the data we have now is, is post hedgehog therapy largely. So, you know, it's not even clear what the response rate to immunotherapy is as an upfront treatment. So I think that is, it would just be investigational at the present time. Another question that's here is, is there a rational best approach to sequencing immunotherapy and hedgehog pathway inhibitors? And of course, the immunotherapy is uh, largely approved for after the use of hedgehogs, but uh, Dr. Kuchgar, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, in my practice, um, hedgehog inhibitors are, are still frontline based on the data. I, I think as we investigate this further, you know, it's do we look at something with, you know, higher response rates um, versus something that may have more durability, uh, depending on, especially in a metastatic patient where maybe your response rate doesn't matter. I still think. Um, immunotherapy up front is primarily investigational unless there is a reason that the patient would not be able to take a hedgehog inhibitor. Yeah, I, I agree. We, we are still using um, the hedgehog up front. Uh, the response rates are good um, with that. And then the, the clinical data we have currently is, is largely the immunotherapy um, as second line. There is Small study, uh, Dr. Chang out of Stanford looked at combination uh, pembrolizumab mm -hmm. and, and bismodegia, but uh, that is still all investigational at this point. And then with that, I think we can move on to, to your piece, Dr. Kuchkar. Right, well, hopefully we can answer some of these questions through cases. Um, the first case is, as you can see here, a, a a large basal cell um, came to our surgeons. Um, they performed imaging that showed it was really in the soft tissue. There was no bony involvement and wanted to reach out to Dr. Migden, probably sees these more than uh, Dr. Lewis. When you look at a case like this, um, do you think about systemic therapy or, or do you proceed with radiation? And then, excuse me, with surgery. Yeah. Well, the back is uh, much more amenable to surgery. I've certainly operated on tumors this size very successfully and reconstructed them uh, when there's no uh, deep extension. So just no bone involvement is good, but knowing that you don't have substantial muscle involvement uh, helps as well in terms of me doing it under local anesthesia. And uh, I used tumescent anesthesia, which is pumped in dilute anesthesia. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't have the measurement. I just have, you know, what relationship it is to the size of the shoulder and the back. So it's quite large, but that for basal cell doesn't mean it's not uh, clearable. So I perhaps would add um, just to MRI to look at, you know, the soft tissue depth. I think that's a good point. This is a case uh, that was presented at our, our tumor board and, and we did proceed with surgery. Um, we tend to, if it's resectable, still go with surgery up front um, rather than a systemic therapy. Um, if it was involving the bone, I, th I think we would reconsider that decision-making. Dr. Lewis, at your institution, would it have been a similar pattern? 
I think so. You know, that's obviously a large tumor and it's a much different scenario if that's on the cheek versus on the back there. So given the location, if that's amenable to resection, we would uh, most likely have, have gone with a surgical approach. And would size alone after surgery be an indication for uh, adjuvant radiation, Dr. Megvin? No. Okay. So yes, we would look at the pathologic features and, and then determine whether further radiation would be needed. Moving on to a different case, this is a, a gentleman who actually had metastatic disease to the lungs. Um, he had a large basal cell in his ear, um, had imaging performed due to pain, which showed the lung metastasis, is not ear, he had a metastasis to his ear, but a 10 centimeter lesion on his arm and had metastasis to the bone as well. He was initiated on Vismodegib and saw a marked improvement in the lesion on the, on the arm and um, less odor, you know, less ulceration. But now he's been on therapy for a few months. He was really excited up front, actually doing better. I, I think less wound issues, but he's beginning to have alopecia. And at his clinic visit, we know to, a 4.5 kilogram weight loss. He's also reporting having cramping in his hands. So Dr. Lewis, when this presents to your clinic with these symptoms, how do you help manage the uh, weight loss as well as the cramping? Well, I honestly haven't found any great uh, remedies for these toxicities. And so our practice tends to be uh, rather liberal drug holidays. And so, you know, I tend to treat patients kind of to the point of tolerability and then take a break. And I found that patients don't tend to start progressing rapidly. They can take quite an extended break, have stability of their disease. And then once they're feeling better, try to restart them uh, on the, the therapy. You know, in, encouraging high, high calorie intake, um, lifestyle changes in terms of you know, stretching while in bed to avoid a triggering cramping, but it, it, it can often be very difficult. So what I found to be, be the best is, is really drug holidays. Yeah, these are um, difficult uh, things to manage. I don't have a good solution either for the muscle cramping. We've tried muscle relaxers. I've had patients firmly believe in pickle juice, but I really haven't found a good solution. I think as Dr. Migden mentioned in his talk, the multidisciplinary team can be really helpful involving dietitians as well as nursing staff to, to help these patients through it um, if they're not ready to take a break. So Dr. Migden, are there any other steps or any other remedies that you have in managing these hedgehog toxicities? Absolutely. So although drug holidays are certainly uh, advisable for multiple complaints, uh, for the individual complaints, uh, you know, uh, acetyl L-carnitine has been tried uh, twice a day um, for uh, Discusia, I ask patients, is there any food you can taste, you know, so trying to focus on spicy foods or certain things that can perhaps break through the loss of taste. I suppose uh, uh, Marinol or nowadays just, you know, marijuana could potentially increase appetite. Um, you know, and although minoxidil has been tried for hair loss, what we know about the hair loss uh, so far is that people that are on uh, for shorter intervals will tend to get their hair growing back. And then uh, uh, if people stay on longer term, the hair loss or hair thinning can become permanent. So if it's somebody we're not planning to keep on, you know, that long, you can tell them just, you know, well, there's a good chance that your hair density will return after you discontinue treatment. Appreciate those. So this is what's been reported, uh, Dr. Chang, about the timeline for toxicities. Um, similar to what we, we've seen in this patient, that early on, um, the dyskesia, the alopecia, 
and the muscle cramping are, are really what you see early on in therapy. So this patient decides, you know, he, want, he wants to truck through, he has metastatic disease, um, he gets repeat imaging, and uh, the lung metastases uh, have improved, and he's responding to therapy. Bone mets, as you know, are, are difficult to follow sometimes. They, they're stable, there are no new lesions, but he's continuing to lose weight, and it's coming up on Christmas time. He basically says, I'm, I'm done with it. You know, my family's coming. We're having a big dinner. I'm tired of not being able to taste. This is a common scenario, um, Dr. Lewis, you mentioned in your talk that, that it's often the, the patient that says, I'm done and I don't want to do further therapy more than it's the physician. Um, I find in my clinic, I talk to them about the risks and benefits of continuing on. I have a lot of patients that I have to encourage to get off um, when they're losing weight significantly, but many do just tell me uh, I'm not doing this anymore. So you talked, Dr. Lewis, a little before about drug holds. So whether the patient initiates it or, or the physician, what do you think is the appropriate duration of the drug hold? And months only till disease progression, um, or do you have a set interval? I do not have a set interval. There, there is some data that the Stevie study looked at doing, you know, scheduled breaks in treatment. But in my practice, I really just kind of dose to tolerability and then hold until they're feeling better. And just, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's very rare that you'll see these patients rapidly progress when stopping the therapy. So I do think that they have time to take a meaningful break for them, you know, many weeks to a few months and just let their, you know, system reset, the cramping stop, get some of their taste back um, and just back to a better quality of life and then rechallenging them with the drug in, in most instances. And in terms of recovery, it, it's, it's been quite variable. You know, some patients um, who, who take breaks have reported that they've gotten their taste back uh, rel in a relatively short period of time. Others, it's, it's more protracted. So I, I haven't seen, at least in my experience, that, that there's very predictable expected recoveries, you know, across the board. I'm not sure what your experience has been in that regard. Uh, I've had a similar experience. Um, I, I also, I guess people are going to know that I may have trained with you a decade or so ago. I have a similar practice of, of holding a little bit indefinitely um, as the patient recovers. I, I do think taste and, and hair growth can take a significant amount of time um, for the patient to feel fully recovered. Um, and, and really gain their weight back. Dr. Mignon, has this been your experience and is this your practice? Yeah, certainly weight can be a longer challenge as well as hair. Uh, the muscle cramping can be reduced in the drug holiday. And I just wanted to bring up the point that within the last few years, there were at least three publications addressing the potential to have uh, cells persist in a slow um, quiescent, you know, a slow cycling, a quiescent state through a cell identity switch. And you could think of these as sleeper cells. So although during drug holidays, you may not see, uh, you know, a, a resistance type tumor growing, the potential to generate these cells that can become uh, activated uh, if the hedgehog inhibitor is, is stopped later in the, in the course of treatment. Um, in practice, even though that's you know, more uh, uh, bench with some human correlate uh, research in practice. I haven't seen a lot of it, but the argument might be that if you wait uh, several years, uh, tumors that look like they're gone may actually, you know, start growing again because they were in this uh, dormant state. So I, I think that's important to at least consider. The, the point of the articles of the two nature letters and cancer cell articles were that drug holidays should not be uh, given with abandon, you know, that there may be a consequence to them. So. Good point. 
So um, that brings us actually to, to exactly that point is when do you restart treatment? This patient has been off three months. He's stable. He's no longer having his muscle cramps. His weight is up a bit. Um, Dr. Migden, will you restart treatment at this point? The disease has not progressed. Yeah, I mean, that's a longer uh, time off. Um, you have to ask yourself also, even independent of cell identity switch, uh, quiescent cells, just how much treatment effect are you going to deliver with the patient if you have long gaps without treatment? And we know basal cell carcinoma is a slow growing cancer in general. So just not seeing obvious growth in the tumor is not a guarantee that there isn't activity below. So it sounds like you'd definitely restart, Dr. Lewis. Yeah, I, um, if he was, if we saw evidence of continued benefit prior to the drug holiday, I, I would um, talk to him about uh, restarting at, at this point in time and just see what, what happens uh, to the tumor uh, with rechallenge of, of the drug. Yeah, it, this patient, it was offered for him to restart. He was kind of, I think he started to feel so good off treatment. I, I, don't, I don't think he was very much interested in, in restarting. But at six months, things still are, are definitely growing. Um, and at this point, um, you know, you have a patient that, that did well, um, but did have the typical toxicities of hedgehog. Uh, would you go to semiplumab, Dr. Migden, because of his prior intolerance, or would you consider the hedgehog inhibitor again? So I would always have the discussion with the patient because I really believe that we should bring the patients into these decisions. If the patient says, as I've had a couple say, hey, you know, the, the muscle cramps occurred and yeah, I noticed them, but it's not, it's not that you know, big a deal, then you might consider it. But if a patient's saying, hey, I'm really having difficulty with those things, then I would certainly consider moving on to semiplumab. And Dr. Lewis, have you ever tried different hedgehog inhibitors and had different responses? In my experience, they're very similar on target effects as far as toxicities from the hedgehog inhibitor. Have you noted anything different? No, I, I really haven't uh, had the practice of switching from one, one hedgehog to the other as a means to, to manage toxicity. So, um, I, you know, I... I think this patient would fall into that category of, um, you know, he was, he had toxicity from hedgehog. He decided to come off for that toxicity. His disease is progressing. And now I, I think that would be, if he's a candidate for immunotherapy, this would be a case where you could, you know, really consider that. So I, I think we discussed, uh, uh, most of these questions that I think Vismo, um, for the most part, will work again, and, and people do have similar adverse events. Um, and I think there is a role of, you know, semiplumab in patients who, who have been intolerant to the hedgehog inhibitors. So this switching gears to a different patient who had a left ear um, basal cell carcinoma, but developed recurrent disease and had an enlarged um, mass in the ear, as well as cervical adenopathy and imaging also shown bone mats and biopsy confirmed stage four disease. He was also initiated on hedgehog, had some isolated progression that was symptomatic and radiated, um, but developed progression of his disease in November, 2020 and he initiated treatment on semiplumab. So after two doses, the patient calls in and says, I'm starting to have a headache, anorexia. Um, he said he started doing ibuprofen and Tylenol, but he's not having relief. And he just feels like he can't eat and get out of bed. 
Dr. Lewis, what would be your next steps in, in the management of this patient? I think we need to look <clears throat> at the MRI of his brain. There's a concern for hypophysitis here. Most definitely, I agree. Um, when the patient came in, he was uncomfortable, but really his vitals were stable. Um, and I, I do think an MRI of the brain with pituitary cuts um, is, is definitely my next step as well. As so, well as, I'm sorry, as well as checking hormone values, yeah. cortisol and so forth. So AM cortisol, TSH, free T4, I always say in, in these patients checking both the TSH and the free T4 can be helpful since immune therapy can, can cause primary thyroid disease as well as pituitary disease. Um, when we did that in this patient, we did find hypophysitis and he was started on replacement doses of hydrocortisone and he feels much better. Um, headaches are gone, appetite's getting better. And he's now in clinic for his dose three of semifolumab. Dr. Migden, would you restart treatment? Yeah. Recovered and was not uh, high grade anyway. So certainly would. And then just a comment for the last bit also is that uh, more than one immune related adverse event can occur at the same time. So I'm not uh, someone who would hold back doing just full panels of labs, you know, to look for anything else. A hundred percent. Yeah, I would say uh, immune therapy can cause all different problems and um, the basal cell is very uncommon to go to the brain if you're using these drugs and other tumor types. Uh, it's another thing you can think of with headaches. Um, moving forward, Dr. Lewis, you agree, you would restart treatment? Yes, I would restart treatment. You know, early on with PD-1 antibodies, you know, we, any kind of toxicity like this, we do some trepidation about restarting, but you know, quickly realize that most of the endocrinopathies are permanent and they don't recover. Um, you can manage them with hormone replacement therapy, uh, depending on, on what is effective. And we generally restart patients who have endocrinopathies uh, on, on the immunotherapy. I agree. Uh... Endocrinopathies are permanent, and I, I think early on when we were using them, uh, we would do high dose steroids similar to what we used to do, uh, or we still do for for other immune related toxicities. Um, but in given their permanence, uh, replacement doses can work as well, and and I involve my endocrinologist frequently to make sure we get those doses right. Just a comment on endocrinopathies, you know, I've had patients present in so many different ways. Um, the most, one of the most serious and dreaded endocrinopathy is type one diabetes with a presentation of DKA, gentleman with severe fatigue, polydipsia, polyuria. Um, I got called from the emergency room. He was in DKA and I was panicked because I had just seen him a week ago and I thought, oh my goodness, I missed his hyperglycemia and his sugar was a hundred the week before. So just because you recently saw someone, um, it doesn't mean they can't acutely develop it. Um, another patient presented, called the clinics and I'm short of breath, I have palpitations. I had already ordered the CT of the chest thinking it was pneumonitis. It turned out to be AFib with RVR from thyroiditis. And then there are other patients that present just on lab abnormalities. Um, we routinely check uh, thyroid studies on treatment for these patients. Dr. Migden, Dr. Lewis, are these your practices as well to um, monitor the thyroid even in um, asymptomatic patients? Absolutely, very common occurrence, so definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it, thyroid is so common that, that it's part of our routine labs for sure. So, and again, I tend to check both TSH and the free T4, just because you can see both thyroiditis as well as primary pituitary. But I say endocrinopathy sneak up on you. So monitor them um, 
even in just minor fatigue. So moving on, um, the patient decides to continue therapy and you get repeat imaging after his th third dose and the PET CT shows increased activity in all the bone metastasis suggestive of progression. And I think uh, the talks by both Dr. Lewis and Dr. Migden really discuss this. Um, but my question to you, Dr. Migden, is this appropriate time to restage on immunotherapy? Uh, so, yeah. So this is just those three. I think those three on every three weeks. So, so he's a almost three months in to, yeah. to therapy. So I, I think, it, you know, six to 10 months is a more appropriate, like trying to decide where you're at. Uh, these tumors respond slower than squamous cell carcinomas and 20% of squamous cell carcinomas have a non-conventional, uh, an unconventional uh, later response as well. So uh, I, I just think that, um, if the patient's tolerating treatment is the question. And then you have to ask yourself, what are the alternatives if you were to stop, you know? So that's my perspective. That's a good point. Dr. Lewis? I agree. <clears throat> you know, these, these responses can be uh, delayed. So you don't want to give up on this uh, too soon. And um, there's not a whole lot of options after this. So, you know, this, you don't want to, uh, take away this person's chance to get a meaningful uh, immunologic response by uh, first assessment, not seeing response and, and giving up. And you presented this nicely earlier where it, where it definitely shows that um, at the real two month mark, even the four to six month mark, there, there are patients that you may not seek response. And I find that PET CTs can be tricky to interpret on immunotherapy as, as much of immune response can cause hypermetabolic activity as well. Yes. Yeah. And trying to assess a response in bones is, is difficult as well. So right. there's a lot of factors here that would say, you know, not don't give up quite yet. So, you know, the patient does move on and get more therapy. And I don't know if this is the case in, in your clinic. I have either patients that get zero toxicity or patients that get everything. And he has shortness of breath or cough. Um, this is his CT of the chest and his oxygen sats are low. And this is your pretty classic uh, presentation for pneumonitis, but I wanna compare it to a different scenario where a patient just has routine imaging and inflammation is just found on the CT. Um, the radiologist reads it as inflammatory changes suggestive of drug reaction. The patient's asymptomatic in the clinic and his oxygen saturations at rest and with activity are fine. And I think these are two different cases of, of pneumonitis on a CT. Uh, Dr. Lewis, how would you handle these scenarios? Well, for the, for the gentleman who's symptomatic, you, he needs to go on steroids. Um, the one that's found just on follow-up scan, that's much more difficult. And we, we, we have seen this occasionally as well. And you know, if the patient is, is truly asymptomatic and it's just a radiographic finding, um, if, if there's evidence that they're benefiting from the immune therapy, I have pushed on in these situations, really carefully watching the patient for any kind of decompensation. Um, and I've had a, a handful of patients who, would, who never become symptomatic. They just sort of sit there with this kind of radiographic findings suggestive of pneumonitis. They, they remain asymptomatic. They don't progress radiographically. Um, so that, that's a situation that is tough, but I have pushed forward in, in those situations on occasion. I have a pattern of sometimes if, if they're completely asymptomatic, um, I will hold the dose and, and reevaluate them to make sure it's not the tip of, of them becoming symptomatic. I kind of weigh it based on the CT scan and how how convinced I am that it's pneumonitis. 
Um, but I always say wait, waiting and uh, repeating imaging to make sure it's not worsening um, is also an, an option. Though if completely asymptomatic and appears mild on the scan, I would try to push forward in a patient, especially like this one, where, where further treatment options are limited. Dr. Migden, what about you? If the patient's asymptomatic, um, I think symptomatic, everyone would start high dose steroids, um, at least a milligram per kilogram. Right. Um, but in an asymptomatic person, Dr. Migden, how would you manage that? You definitely have to increase the frequency of follow up. <laughs> And that's, that's how I would handle it. Ah. So um, pneumonitis does occur in about 3% of, of patients on single agent PD-1. I always say when they're symptomatic, clearly steroids. Occasionally I've had cases where it's unclear um, that they may have other underlying problems like COPD or, or other things. And if you're unclear, bronchoscopy can be helpful to, to rule out other causes, but I'm very quick to start high dose steroids in anyone that's symptomatic. Um, just other immune related events with uh, semiplamab, as was presented earlier, there were no grade four or five toxicities. And they were really all toxicities that have been associated with other PD-1 antibodies from pneumonitis to endocrinopathies, rashes, hepatitis. Um, Dr. Migden, do you wanna comment a little bit on some of the dermatologic adverse events? As, as a medical oncologist, sometimes I feel bad, patients will report pruritus and I, mm. I, I think I need to take it more seriously because <clears throat> it's a real big detriment to their quality of life. And how do you handle those? Yeah, and so various types of skin manifestations from, from just uh, <clears throat> maculopapular uh, eruptions, immune-related uh, uh, dermatoses to uh, bullous. I've had multiple patients uh, on the Empower squamous cell carcinoma have bullous eruptions, and uh, you can treat those uh, with either you know a more modest oral steroid dose or or combination of oral and topical um, and you know these can range anywhere from very modest reactions to pretty dramatic bullous eruptions and in the patients that get the bullous eruptions i've seen them even continue off therapy when they finish their course of treatment their tumors completely gone but these uh, skin dermatoses can can just smolder for some time uh, same thing with erythema same thing with uh, you know the the uh, radiation uh, recall so people in their radiation fields can sometimes light up with a lot of erythema it can just look really even eroded and it's simply just uh, it, from from what i can ascertain an immune response to tissue changes in the radiation field so but these things eventually uh, when patients finish therapy will will very very slowly taper away and 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 resolve but it could take many months for that to be the case thank you so just remember when immune related adverse events um, i think patient education is is really important that multidisciplinary team with our nursing. Um, so hopefully we can have the patient recognize these symptoms early, um, be evaluated in clinic and avoid the emergency room. Um, there are many different algorithms that are published from ASCO, CIPSI, NCCN uh, that can help us manage the immune related adverse events. Um, Whenever something's nonspecific and you can't figure it out, always think of endocrine, especially pituitary, with looking at the cortisol and thyroid. And immune therapy toxicities can be seen even six months post-treatment. So even if someone's off therapy, um, be sure to, to monitor them for these toxicities. So this patient, to, to end on a high note, uh, with discontinued therapy because of grade three pneumonitis, 
Um, but we did continue to follow him as he tapers off his steroids. Um, his PET CT now shows decreasing activity in the bones with no disease. So we're hopeful this patient will have a long-term response and um, we are continuing to monitor him with imaging though he's off all therapy at this time. One last question for you, Dr. Lewis. Uh, once they've stopped therapy, um, do you expect from the studies for the response to be ongoing? Well, it, it remains to be seen. It's, it's still the interim analysis of the metastatic cohort, um, short, relatively short-term follow-up on the locally advanced. But I think if we just look at other tumor types, in particularly cutaneous malignancies who respond to uh, PD-1 immunotherapy, that we can be very optimistic that these will be durable. But, but these patients do need to be watched closely because uh, the data at this point um, is just not there to say for sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuchikar, for those uh, very interesting and informative cases. That was uh, great. I do think we have time for at least one question here. Um, a question from the audience, what are your recommendations for optimal joint practice with medonks and dermonks when managing BCC, uh, communication, collaboration, et cetera. And I also say, add in there, you know, surgical oncologists and, and head and neck surgeons, which can often see these patients uh, as well. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Mignon, do you have thoughts? I do. I feel strongly that uh, this multidisciplinary management of patients is really the most optimal thing for patients. After all, you know, we are dealing with the skin. I know from my perspective as both a Mohs surgeon and a dermatologic oncologist, the way I look at skin can be quite different from people who aren't primary skin physicians. So I think bringing one of the derms, uh, whether it be a Mohs derm onc or a medical derm onc on is really important. And I do think, as has been mentioned, the other specialties such as surgical oncology and head and neck surgery can provide their perspective, especially for deeper seated uh, lesions. And I think, you know, I've been asked in the past for us that are, you know, really uh, heavy dermatologic oncology practices, whether it's clinical trials or or prescribing otherwise, you know, who has to prescribe this medication? And that's not really the, the best question to ask. It's not so much about who is the prescriber, it's about who's going to take responsibility for these patients. And so people that take responsibility for these patients should have done due diligence and really focus on patient care, really uh, connect with the patients in terms of both their uh, what's going on with them, how are they feeling, uh, their quality of life, as well as the manifestations on the skin and also deeper set uh, uh, lesions by imaging. Yeah, I, I agree. Multidisciplinary management of these patients is crucial. And I think in relative terms, you know, having good medical therapies for these advanced non-melanoma skin cancers uh, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma is new and, um, you know, receptibility is in the eye of the beholder and, um, you know, often disfiguring uh, surgeries without getting good margins doesn't do any favors to the patient. So I think involving as many people as you can in terms of assessing what might be the best uh, option for upfront treatment for these locally advanced patients is, is critical. Dr. Kuchikar, do you have any thoughts? I 100% agree. I say I, I am very lucky uh, that my clinic has uh, a dermatologist and surgeon right there with me because it's not uncommon that we need each other to help manage these patients. And the, the very locally advanced metastatic basal cells are, are rare are rare in general. So bringing them to a tumor board where you can get everyone's opinion is just gonna improve the management of these patients and allow them to have all the options. Cause you're right, I've seen things that I'm like, there's no way they can resect that. And the surgeon looks at it, oh, that's no problem. We can take care of that. And so um, I try not to make decisions on any of these patients um, as a solitary medical oncologist. Um, I think these cases are, are really ideal for tumor boards. So everyone 
um, can be involved in their management from the beginning. And I think that gives the most options to the patient. Well, great. That was a, a fantastic discussion. And I think we'll move on and, and wrap this up. And in terms of uh, synthesizing and, and final take homes for this presentation, basal cell carcinoma is the most common malignancy. And fortunately, most are localized and easily amenable uh, to local therapy, primarily resection. But locally advanced basal cell carcinoma and metastatic basal cell carcinoma can be a very difficult disease to treat. And you see high response rates with molecularly targeted therapy, uh, hedgehog pathway inhibitors, but toxicity and resistance are significant issues uh, with these agents. Uh, basal cell carcinomas do have a high tumor mutation burden, and this may contribute to their immunogenicity. And semiplumab, which is a PD-1 antibody, has now demonstrated many meaningful responses and disease control in this setting. Um, thank you very much for uh, your um, for listening and watching, and thank you, Dr. Kuchikar and Dr. Migden. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash TPR 860. This activity is supported by an independent medical education grant from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals Incorporated and Sanofi Genzyme.